I want to do the Stockhausen Originale, which is a score for uh, a painter to come be himself, a poet to come be himself, a musician to come be himself, and it's all timed in the clock, and you come at a certain time and you do your thing. Uh, and it's structured in that fashion. He doesn't tell you what to do while you're on stage for that amount of time, but it, you have to follow the uh, time uh, schedule. So I went to see him, and he, he said, well, um, I did that for certain people. I did that for Hans Helms. And I said, well, we've got Allen Ginsberg here, the poet. He said, well, you need Kaspari, the director. I said, we have Alan Capra, who invented the happening, more or less. What a better director do you have than that? He said, well, you have to have Pike. And I said, what's a Pike? <laughs> and it turns out that it's a human being, Nam June Pike. And I said, well, why do I need him? And he said, because he, I wrote the part for him, Pike. That's what is on the score, and no one else can play Pike but Pike. I said, oh, my Lord, that, for that one person, I can't do it. And he said, well, he's always wanted to come to America. And his family have a little bit of money. They could give him the money to come. Now his family doesn't exist anymore, but at that time he could have borrowed the money from them to come to America. He said, now I'll give you his address in Germany. You contact him, invite him over, tell him that I have given permission to do the originale on the provision that you come do your, your uh, realization of your part. Go back to the Hotel Paris, and I'm not lying to you. The minute I get in my room, the phone rings, and it was Pike. He said, Pike here? And I said, where? He <laughs> said, here in New York City. I thought that was incredible. What had happened, we found out years later, is that Mary Baumeister found out from Allison Knowles that Pike was here. He had just arrived. And she says, oh, we're trying to locate him. We were just talking about him to do the originale. You should call this girl named Charlotte Mormon and gave him my number. And that's how. But I always wondered for years how it was that he called me at that <clears> very <throat> moment. He said, we'll meet. And uh, I was answering phones part-time uh, because the American Symphony was over. Now, what I was doing uh, in the traditional world, I was playing the American Symphony. I was doing TV jingles. I was just beginning all these things. But in the summer, the season was not on, so I answered phones at night on the weekend in order to make money. So I told him I had to go to work to this answering service. He said, I'll meet you there. So he did. I don't know how. You know, he's incredible how I could understand the New York subway system. He just arrived in New York, and he was able to, to find his way over to the east side to the answering service. And we were sitting there in the Madison Cafe, and he said to me, oh, he said, we do originale, and so-and-so, uh, Allen Ginsberg would be great poet, and I'll be great painter, and I'm talking about all these people that were going to do these wonderful parts. And Dick Higgins was in it, and Jackson McLow, and Robert Breer, and it was just an incredible, uh, it turned out to be a, a absolutely fabulous performance. And we did it every night for a week. Excuse me. So he helped me to, to get that together. And uh, David Berriman and Mary Baumeister translated the German script into English for our, our uh, performers. Max Newhouse was a percussionist. I was a string player. And we had to have a chimpanzee. That was very difficult. I never will forget that. But anyway, so... <laughs> So we, we, we were sitting there, and he said, oh, I, I make peace for you. And he said, we become partners. I'm looking at him, I'm wondering, why do I need him for a partner? I didn't understand what, I, I do peace for you. He said, you play swan, you stop, you go into water, you come out in pajama, and you come out wet, and you finish swan. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> I, I didn't understand why. I mean, who needed this? And um, he was telling me all these pieces, this uh, striptease piece that he's always wanted to do. He's always wanted to, uh, a beautiful girl to striptease. And he wanted me to play cello and take my clothes off. And I just, I can't believe that I'm sitting here talking to this, this, this oriental man about these things. And, uh, but something about him, he's so serious and so strong that I listen. And we became partners. And... Uh, Everything in the world has happened to us now as a result. I don't know if you want me to go ahead now and start telling you what all has happened, or if you want me to finish telling you, oh, just to him alone. But when we did the originale, he, someone came and handcuffed him to the scaffolding, because Alan Capra had the scaffolding. It was very important that he was directing from and everything. And Pike was drinking from his shoe. He had put, in, <laughs> he had put shaving cream and beans and ketchup on his face, and he was drinking from his shoe, and someone came and handcuffed him to the scaffolding. 
And I uh, thought that this was part of the piece. I didn't know that. <laughs> I thought that, you know, that this was part of what Pike wanted to do on purpose. And he was screaming and screaming. And everybody thought it was part of it. And nobody paid any attention. <laughs> Finally, someone came back to me and said, Pike is in pain. He, he is, this is sabotage. Oh, okay. Someone has handcuffed him to the scaffolding. So we tried to get the janitor. The janitor didn't have a hacksaw, so I called the police. I told them that, well, we were doing a performance and that one of the artists was handcuffed to some scaffolding. Would they please bring a, ha a hacksaw? Now, Alan Capra had said to me, he was trying to defeminize me, and he put me in a gauze gown. I was totally nude under the gauze gown. You could see straight through it, and it had the opposite effect. It, it did not defeminize me at all. I played nude for the first time in this performance. And uh, I was standing there naked under the gauze, which is just this thin stuff that you bandage your finger with, you know. And Max Newhouse had on red leotards um, and ears. No, no, he had on red leotards. That's what he was playing his uh, percussion with. And Jim Tenney had on the fur ears and the fur G-string. And the police came, and Mr. Seaman came running to me backstage, and he said, Charles, whatever you do, don't call the police. I said, I already have. Why not? He said, because we are breaking every law in the world. He said, you can't have the fish bowls hanging in the animals. You can't have the chimpanzee. You can't feed the audience. You can't go around naked. And he, he started in on all the things we can't do, and the police came in. So um, the police just looked at us, and at this moment, the chimpanzee comes walking up without the trainer <laughs> in her little blue dress. Her name was Priscilla. And it's against the law. You can't have a chimpanzee without the trainer holding the chimpanzee. And uh, so for the first time, I don't know how it happened, but she got lost from her trainer and she was wandering around. The policeman's terrified. And he looks, he said, well, who's going to prefer charges? Because we're all dressed in our way we're dressed. The person that had handcuffed Pike, they, they, they uh, ran him down the fire escape and caught him. He was dressed in a suit and necktie. He looked wonderful for the rest of us. You know, we really looked terrible. Well, Mr. Seaman started peeling off $10 bills. And the policeman would say, she's naked under the gauze. $10. <laughs> the chimpanzee has no, no, no uh, guardian. $10. And it went on. The policeman, is, he was going down the list of all these things that was wrong. And you're throwing food at the audience. $10. <laughs> About $100 later, they left. <laughs> And Mr. Seaman was so mad at me, but we got Pike freed from the... <laughs> later, we found out at a performance where Pike and I were performing. It was very funny. It was later, in 1966, we were performing in the Rhode Island College of uh, Art or, or whatever it's called. Rhode Island. At Brown University, our performance was. And uh, there were, it was for Nobel Prize, there were, well, no, for physicists. And in the audience, our audience were four Nobel Prize winners. And... Um, we were performing, and the guy who brought us there, the director of the uh, museum, turns out it was his brother that had handcuffed Pike to the scaffolding. <laughs> you know, I mean, you find these things out eventually, year after year, you, that all these stories come uh, uh, back to you. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to tell you, in that second festival, the important thing was the change of the direction, because meeting Namjoon Pike uh, and the pieces that he started writing for me, uh, were unlike anything I had ever played before in my life. Uh, he wrote the piece for me where I play the swan to the halfway point. I stop, I go into an oil drum of water, I come out dripping wet and I finish the swan. He wrote the striptease piece for me that year where I uh, play a few measures of Bach, take something off, uh, continue Bach, continue stripping until I'm totally nude on the floor with the cello on top of me. Uh, and we do that piece, we splice it back and forth with film. Sometimes we use Stan Vanderbeek film, sometimes we use Robert Breer film. Uh, and that's called Sonata for Adults Only. And, uh, um, and the robot, he premiered the robot that year, and that's this um, mechanical man made of, uh, well, actually it's bisexual. It had breasts and a penis. And it walked and it talked and it shit little white beans. And uh, so he premiered that in the festival. And another historically important thing that happened that year is that George Machunas, the director of Fluxus, started picketing us. And I had never been involved in a picket before, and Allen Ginsberg uh, was with me as I walked in the hall, and I didn't know what to do to pass a picket line outside of an art event. And he said, here, follow me. So he grabbed a picket sign, he gave me a picket sign, he said, now come on, follow me. So we picketed our own performance, 
in a circle there uh, that uh, right across the street from Carnegie Hall in, in um, Manhattan. And I was in my first picket line, and it was my performance, my festival. I was picketing myself, and then when it came time for us to perform, we put our picket signs down, went in, and did our performance. But that became the, the long, that was the beginning of the long fight that George Machunas and I had through the years, that uh, he felt that, uh, that his artists shouldn't be in the festival, they should only do his fluxus things, and I felt that the artists should do absolutely everything, perform everywhere, and go everywhere that they can, and be a part of anything and everything. So George and I disagreed on that, uh, that issue. But uh, I think the important part of that second festival was the fact that we did the Stockhausen Originale. We had our evening of music. We did, uh, for the first time, very important, on all Varez program. Edgar Varez had never had a one-man show in New York City. He was world famous. Everywhere else had he had it, but not in New York City. So that was a beautiful night. We had the ensemble night. We had electronic music night. And Pike and I did our first performance in 1964 Whoa. together.